The subject of today's session is the next prophecy in Isaiah. Now, of course, as you know, we aren't keeping exactly in step with the beginnings of chapters. As we've discussed on a number of occasions, the division of the books of the Bible, with the exception of the Psalms, into chapters is a relatively late one and occasionally an arbitrary one. And in this instance, I think it being arbitrary is a little bit glaring because in considering the unit that is the subject of today's discussion, beginning in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, and concluding in Isaiah chapter 10, verse 4, we can clearly see a theme running for the length of the passage, even in a way like a poem with a refrain, although it's not a very pleasant poem and not at all a happy refrain. An additional issue that inevitably presents itself in our considering this passage, which we're about to begin to read, is trying to understand how it relates to what we saw before in the previous passage in the book of Isaiah, because formally it seems to be on a completely different note and a very different sort of message. And as we see right at the outset, there is indeed an even more basic question with respect to the appropriateness of this prophecy altogether in the book of Isaiah. Let's see what we mean. Beginning again with chapter 9, verse 7. God sent a word into Jacob, and it has lighted or fallen upon Israel. Now, we should note that while Jacob and Israel can be synonymous, Israel also has a more specific sense in the political climate at this time, because there's the kingdom of Judah, and then there's the kingdom of northern Israel. And it becomes very clear in the next verse that we're speaking of the latter. And all the people shall know, even Ephraim and the inhabitant of Samaria, that say in pride and in arrogancy of heart. This prophecy pertains specifically to what is taking place in northern Israel, which of course inevitably presents us with a major question. After all, as we see in the opening verse of the book of Isaiah, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Jerusalem, of course, the capital of Judah. So Isaiah isn't sent as a prophet to northern Israel. What's a prophecy about northern Israel doing here? And on some plane, perhaps we can answer very simply that the prophecy may be about northern Israel, but in a sense it isn't to the people there, because the prophet, as we'll see presently, is speaking about them, not to them in second person, but rather about them in third person. Indeed, in this entire passage, there is precisely one verse, the next to last verse, in chapter 10, verse 3, that speaks in second person. And of course, inevitably, we'll need to ask, to whom is the prophet turning with these words? But now when we ask of what relevance is this prophecy concerning northern Israel to what immediately preceded it in the book of Isaiah, we have a fairly glaring indication in this opening statement in verse 8, speaking about 
people speaking in pride and in arrogancy of heart. As we'll see, the theme of arrogance is very central one in this passage with devastating ramifications. Why is it important for the prophet to address himself to us through this message concerning northern Israel at this stage? Well, inevitably we recall what we saw in the opening verses of chapter 9, which really belonged to the previous prophecy. Those opening verses presented to us a very uplifting and exhilarating message. Beginning in verse 1, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them has the light shined. And of course, as we saw, this clearly pertains to the destruction of the Assyrian army and the threat that it posed to Judah. That is, the Assyrian army destroyed northern Israel, threatened to overrun Judah as well, laying siege to Jerusalem. But it was, with thanks to God, destroyed at that final moment. And so the people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased their joy. They joy before you as the joy in harvest, when they rejoice, when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken, as in the day of Midian. Clearly intimating the destruction of the Assyrian threat, every boot stamped with fierceness, or weapons in the battle's tumult. However, we construe the first part of the verse, every cloak rolled in blood shall be for burning, for fuel of fire. The battle is over. And then, finally, the most exhilarating words of all, for a child is born unto us, a son is given unto us, the government is placed upon his shoulder, we saw what the name of the child is, and the message to him who increases the government and for peace without end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to establish it and to support it through justice and through righteousness from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the God of hosts does perform this. What an uplifting message, and therein lies the danger. Because having been promised this miraculous salvation from Judah's enemies, there is, of course, the inevitable danger that people might start getting prideful and arrogant themselves. We won! We didn't win. God won. God bestowed a gift. But we dare not take that gift presumptuously and see in it any kind of justification for our pride or arrogance. And we note then that this sets the tone for how we read this passage. And I'm going to remind you of an observation to which we keep on returning, namely that the prophet is, after all, first and foremost, addressing his contemporaries, speaking to his direct audience. It's only by our appreciating the message he conveys to them that we understand the derivative message that he intends for us, for all generations. Here, in as much as the prophecy itself concerns a different group of people, northern Israel. We are, in a sense, in the same situation as the prophet's audience, the people of Judah, in that he's talking about someone else. 
but intending in talking about them to teach us. And it is, of course, in that vein, then, that we need to consider what he has to say about them and us. Again, this theme, pride, arrogancy of heart. The heart, as the metaphorical seat of pride and arrogance when the heart is misused, is a theme that we encounter elsewhere in the Bible as well. We'll note Deuteronomy chapter 8, where we get a very stern warning, beginning in verse 11. Beware, lest you forget God your Lord in not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes, which I command you this day. What will lead you to such forgetfulness? Verse 12, lest when you have eaten and are satisfied and have built good houses and dwell therein, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and your gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart, the heart again, your heart is lifted up, and you forget God your Lord. And that may lead, verse 17, to the veritable heresy that you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. Well, on the one hand, of course, in some sense it has. It is your power and the might of your hand, but where did you get that power from? Verse 18, warning, you shall remember God your Lord, for it is he who gave you power to get wealth. A similar theme with respect to a heart being uplifted to the point of destruction, we read in the book of Daniel, in chapter 5, when Daniel is summoned to explain the strange writing that has miraculously appeared upon the wall in the feast of Belshazzar, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Chaldeans. And Daniel here has very blunt words of rebuke. Beginning in verse 18, God Most High gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, the kingdom and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. But that resulted in the sin of hubris. When his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened, that he sinned willfully, he was deposed from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. And he was driven from the sons of men. And his heart was made like the beasts, measure for measure. The sin of the heart is punished in the heart. And continuing in verse 22, you, his son, O Belshazzar, has not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, and you lifted up yourself against the God of heaven. In taking the holy vessels from the holy temple and using them in your banquet. And the punishment is, you lose your kingdom. That night, Belshazzar was slain. The danger of the heart being lifted up. The danger of inevitable, consequent destruction. The truth is that we have already seen in the book of Isaiah this theme and this warning. The danger of haughtiness and arrogance, hubris, pride, and its consequences. And how man must learn to be humbled. In Isaiah chapter 2, 
and man bows down, and man has become humble, then you shall not forgive them. In verse 11, the lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and God alone shall be exalted in that day. Verse 12, for the God of hosts has a day upon all that is proud and lofty, and upon all that is lifted up, and he shall become humble. And after the metaphors, imagery of the succeeding verses, concluding in verse 17, again, the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the holiness of men shall be humbled, and God alone will be exalted in that day. Of course, we should stress here, God being exalted is never for God. It's for us. It's realizing the meaning and purpose in our lives by exalting God, who is the source of that meaning and purpose, rather than exalting our own petty arrogance and pride. That's a lesson that needs to be learned. And that is an object lesson that the people of Ephraim and Samaria were refusing to learn. That is, what they say in verse 9 is, okay, sure, we experienced devastation and destruction. Nothing to worry about. The bricks are fallen, but we will build with hewn stones, which are even better. The sycamores are cut down, but cedars we will put in their place, which again is a higher quality wood. So we'll just rebuild ourselves. We don't have to pay attention to the calamities that have taken place already as any kind of a message from God that demands of us to put our affairs in order. We'll just continue on our course. Therefore, Verse 10, God does set upon high the adversaries of Ritzin against him and spur his enemies. Remember, Ritzin is the king of Aram, not Israel, but Israel's ally. Recall that in Isaiah chapter 7, we saw the alliance that Ritzin, king of Aram, had with Pekah, the king of Israel. So, to the extent that they may have thought that with the alliance of Aram, their future was guaranteed, God sets the adversaries of Ritzin against him, and the alliance inevitably is lost. Verse 11, the Arameans on the east and the Philistines on the west, and they devour Israel with every mouth. And then we get to our refrain, I mentioned this at the outset, it would almost sound poetic, except that it is so devastating a statement. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. God has punished. Again, the bricks are fallen, the sycamores are cut down, but no one is noticing. Everyone continues business as usual. And so there is no alternative but to increase the severity of the punishment because we read in verse 12, the people return not unto him who smites them, neither do they seek the God of hosts. Now, these themes of returning and seeking are clearly fraught with associations. Because using the self-same expression of, in the Hebrew, shav ad, returning, returning to God, we encounter in Deuteronomy chapter 4, a description of calamity 
God will scatter you among the peoples, you will be left few in number among the nations, where God will lead you away. But from there you will seek God your Lord, and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. Note, here the heart makes a very different sort of appearance. And the consequence of that search is, verse 30, in your distress, when all these things are come to you in the end of days, you will return unto God your Lord and hearken unto his voice. So that returning heralds the rehabilitation of repentance, getting our house in order, returning to God. The self-same theme in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Again, calamity. Verse 1, it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before you, that you shall consider it in your heart. Again, the heart. Among all the nations where God your Lord has driven you. And shall return unto God your Lord to hearken to his voice according to all that I command you this day, you and your children, heart, with all your heart and with all your soul. So returning then signals not merely obedience, but returning to where we were supposed to be in our relationship with God. This isn't even a theme that is unique to Israel. Later on in Isaiah, in chapter 19, we encounter the expression with respect to Egypt. That is, after all the calamities that take place in Egypt, we read in verse 21 that God will make himself known to Egypt and the Egyptians will know God in that day. They shall worship with sacrifice and offering and shall vow a vow unto God and shall perform it in verse 22 and God will smite Egypt smiting and healing why the healing they shall return unto God and he will be entreated of them and will heal them well that's what was supposed to be but here we read in our chapter the people return not to him to him who smites them. That is, God, in this vein, employs the nations as the means of punishment for Israel. We'll read in our next session, in chapter 10, verse 5, where the prophet refers, in God's name, as it were, to Assyria, the rod of my anger. The rod of my anger against whom? against my wayward children who unfortunately need a beating. So God is smiting. And of course, what's critical for us to always bear in mind then and now is that when the geopolitical situation is calamitous, it's not because everyone is doing whatever he pleases. It's because there is a director to the drama and part of his plan entailed our feeling that chastisement. It's supposed to wake us up. It's supposed to rouse us. Indeed, it's supposed to prod us to seek God, but that doesn't happen. Neither do they seek the God of hosts. That expression, seeking, in the Hebrew, darashu, necessarily likewise, invokes another passage in Isaiah, in chapter 55, in verse 6, seek God while he may be found. And that seeking God is explicitly an introduction, a prelude to earnest repentance and consequent forgiveness. In verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way and the man of iniquity his thoughts and let him return unto God and he will have compassion upon him 
and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. But first you need to seek God. If you're not paying attention at all, then inevitably the blows become only more severe, which is exactly what happens. That was the first layer of retribution, and then layer two. Therefore, God does cut off from Israel head and tail, palm branch and rush in one day. Meaning, the prophet explains the metaphor, the elder and the man of esteem, he is the head. The prophet that teaches lies, that is the false prophet, he is the tail. For they that lead this people mislead, and they that are led of them are misled. So, what's happening at this stage? Remember, after the first set of calamities, the people of the council and decided, no problem, we'll just rebuild. It used to be bricks, now we'll use hewn stones. It used to be sycamores, now cedars. We'll just make things better and turn everything to our own advantage. You're not even going to have anyone to guide you anymore in doing that. Because all of the leaders are cut off, swept away. How are they swept away? The prophet doesn't say. He just tells us it happens suddenly, in one day. And of course, inevitably, we're left wondering how exactly this comes to pass. Perhaps, we can't know for sure. The answer is to be found in the second book of Kings, in chapter 15, where we read of the last years of the kingdom of northern Israel. I'm starting in the years immediately preceding Isaiah's prophetic career, because we already noted that Isaiah's inaugural prophecy takes place in the year of the death of Uzziahu, the end of the reign of Uzziahu, the king who is known in the second book of Kings as Azariah, same person, two forms of the name. And so here we read in chapter 15, verse 8, in the 38th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Zechariah, the son of Yeravam, of Jeroboam, reigned over Israel in Samaria six months. Not a very long time, but long enough to establish a record. In verse 9, he did what was evil in the sight of God, as his fathers had done. And after those six months, in verse 10, Shalom, the son of Yavesh, conspired against him and smote him before the people and slew him. This provides us with something of a sorry pattern for the years ahead. In verse 13, we read that this Shalom, son of Yavesh, reigned for a total space of just one month. Because in verse 14, Menachem, the son of Gadi, went up from Tirzah and came to Samaria and smote Shalom, the son of Yavesh, in Samaria and slew him. We don't even have an assessment of whether Shalom did what was evil in the sight of God. I suppose in just a month, he didn't really have a chance to establish any kind of record at all. But we read not only that he... Menachem slew Shalom, Menachem smote Tifsach, and all that were in their inn, and the borders thereof from Tirzah, because they opened not to him. A gruesome description. He smote it, and all the women therein that were with child he ripped up. And we read that he reigned for ten years in Samaria, and he too did what was evil in the sight of God. He departed not all his days from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nevat. And verse 22, Menachem slept with his fathers. 
and Pekachia, his son, reigned in his stead. Menachem, son of Gadi, is the last king of northern Israel to die a natural death in his bed. Because his successor was his son, Pekachia, who reigned only for two years. In that time, we still get the assessment that he did what was evil in the sight of God, departing not from the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nevat. And verse 25, Pekach, the son of Remaliah, his captain conspired against him and smote him in Samaria, in the castle of the king's house by Argob and by Aryeh. And with him were 50 men of the Giladites, and he slew him and, raised in his, and reigned in his stead. So, once again, a bloody rebellion, bloodier still, and then Pekach reigns for 20 years, and he too did what was evil in the sight of God. We read that in his reign, the encroachments of the Assyrian Empire began. And finally, in verse 30, Hoshea, the son of Elah, made a conspiracy against Pekach, the son of Emaliah, and smote him and slew him. Hoshea, the son of Elah, was the last king of northern Israel. It was under his watch that the Assyrian Empire overran northern Israel, destroyed the kingdom, and exiled Israel from its land. So, certainly conceivable that what we read in our chapter regarding the precipitous destruction of the entire leadership is something that simply happened through all these bloody rebellions. There was no one left. And we should note here, too, that the retribution of loss of leaders is neither strange to the prophecies of Isaiah nor to the kingdom of Judah either. We saw this in chapter 3 of Isaiah, which began with harsh words of retribution as well. For behold, God, the God of hosts, takes away from Jerusalem and from Judah Stay and staff, every stay of bread, every stay of water. Clearly, an allusion to the leaders, as becomes clear in the following verses. The mighty man and the man of war, the judge, the prophet, the soothsayer, the elder, the captain of fifty, the man of esteem, the counselor, the cunning charmer, the skillful scrap craftsman, the one who understands secrets. And I will give children to be their princes, and scorners shall rule over them. So, this level of retribution of which we read as level 2 in chapter 9 is likewise something that we recognize in the history of Judah as well. And candidly, I think we recognize in many other circumstances in history too. When the leaders are lost, the flock is without a shepherd. And this is obviously intended to rouse the people to realize how desperate their situation is. If previously they were taking counsel, how are we going to get over our setbacks? Now you don't even have anyone with whom to take counsel. But they don't recognize that. They don't take stock. And so at the end of verse 16, once again, the refrain. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And indeed, the situation in the state becomes ever more dire. Because the consequence of not having leaders to hold sway, to control the state, is the state 
descends into anarchy. This is the next stage. Verse 17, for wickedness burns as the fire, it devours the briars and thorns, yea, it kindles in the thickets of the forest, and they roll upward in thick clouds of smoke. Now, whether this is describing the evil of the people, the wickedness that burns as a fire, or the punishment, because it kindles in the thickets of the forest, and the whole forest goes up in flames, isn't necessarily clear here, nor, arguably, does it really matter, because these are one and the same. It is the wickedness of the people that necessarily, directly, invokes the punishment. And we see this very clearly in the nature of the punishment. This is the third layer, the third level of retribution. Verse 18, through the wrath of the God of hosts is the land burnt up, or alternatively, the smoke has reached the earth. The people also are as the fuel of fire. No man has pity on his brother. And one snatches on the right hand and is hungry, and he eats on the left hand and is not satisfied. They eat every man, the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh with Ephraim, and Ephraim with Manasseh, and they together are against Judah. A war, not merely a brother against brother, it's that too, but this isn't simply a civil war in which at least you could have well-defined sides. This is more a war of everyone against everyone, a descent into total anarchy. You don't have leaders, you have no basis for maintaining any sense of law and order. This is similarly the consequence in Isaiah chapter 3 of the loss of the leadership. There, after reading of all the leaders being swept away, we read in verse 5, and the people shall oppress one another, every man his fellow, every man his neighbor, the child shall behave insolently against the aged and the base against the honorable. Once again, no order, no sense of propriety, no shame. Verse 12, as for my people, a scorner is their master. O oh, my people, they that lead you cause you to err and destroy the way of your paths. And the consequence of that, further deterioration, once again the refrain, in verse 20, for all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. What, you may ask, could possibly be worse than a state that is completely failed and has descended into anarchy? There's worse. In chapter 10, verse 1, the fourth and final layer in this calamitous decline Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees, and to the writers that write iniquity, to turn aside the needy from judgment, to rob the judgment of the poor of my people, that widows may be their spoil, and that they may make the fatherless their prey. This isn't merely anarchy. This is establishing a criminal state. Not the expression here. Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees, and to writers that write iniquity. The philosopher historian Edmund Burke noted in the aftermath of the French Revolution that there is no tyranny worse than bad laws. The criminal state that decrees unrighteous decrees, and by consequence, turning aside the needy from judgment, robbing the judgment of the poor. Admittedly, we saw this also in the indictment of Judah in chapter 3, in verse 14. God will come into judgment with the elders of his people and the princes thereof. It is you 
who have eaten up the vineyard, the spoil of the poor is in your houses. What mean you that you crush my people and grind the face of the poor? Says God, the God of hosts. And so, the people descend to lower and lower levels of depravity and perversion. And it is in the wake of all of this that we come to that single solitary verse, chapter 10, verse 3, the only verse in this entire passage that addresses us, and presumably the people of Judah, the audience of the prophet, directly, not merely describing what happens to them, to northern Israel, but rather the challenge. And what will you do in the day of visitation and in the ruin, the destruction, which will come from far? To whom will you flee for help? And where will you leave your honor? Indeed, challenge. When you are on the brink of utter destruction, what are you going to do? This theme of day of visitation, we encounter likewise in Hosea, Hosea chapter 9. And there likewise, there is the warning against arrogantly thinking everything is fine. Rejoice not, O Israel, unto exaltation. You've gone away from God. You've gone astray. And by consequence, the punishment. The threshing floor and wine press shall not feed them. The new wine shall fail her. They shall not dwell in God's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt, and they shall eat unclean food in Assyria. And after the dire description of retribution, there as well in verse 5, what will you do in the day of the appointed season? in the day of the feast of God. Verse 7, the days of visitation are come. Same expression that Isaiah used. The days of recompense, payback, are come. In verse 9, God will remember their iniquity. He will punish, visit, using the same root as the day of visitation, their sins. Nothing is forgotten. Nothing is forgiven. A recurrent theme that we find in several of the prophets, in much this vein, is the day of God. It's an expression that we encounter in Isaiah as well. In chapter 13, in verse 6, How will you? For the day of God is at hand. As spoiling from the Almighty it shall come. And similarly, in verse 9, Behold, the day of God comes cruel and full of wrath and fierce anger to make the land a desolation and to destroy the sinners thereof out of it. And this day of God becomes a recurrent theme, in particular, among the 12 minor prophets. We find it in each of the chapters of Joel, of Yoel, in chapter 1, verse 15. Alas for the day, for the day of God is at hand. And as a spoiling from the Almighty shall it come. And further elaborating in chapter 2, verse 1. The day of God comes, it is at hand. It is a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as blackness spread upon the mountains. A great people and a mighty, there has not been ever the like, neither shall be any more of it, even to the years of many generations. 
in verse 11, for great is the day of God and very terrible. Who can abide it? And of course, there is a very specific intent in the words of Yoel, referring to the plague of locusts, that is the subject of the prophecy. But there is this implication here, the day of God, and it clearly is not only a day of God in the imminent context of specific punishment coming then, it continues to be the warning of the coming of the day of God. In Yoel chapter 3, verse 4, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of God comes. The great and terrible day of God becomes a theme that is revisited. We don't have time to consider all of the instances in which the expression appears in the words of the prophets. But I'm skipping to less the prophets. And here, manifestly, it speaks of the future. The very last words of the prophet Malachi, the end of the prophets, Behold, I will send you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of God. And he shall return the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the land with utter destruction. This is the day of God, the day of visitation, the day of reckoning. And indeed, in a similar vein, the other expression that Isaiah used in chapter 10, verse 3, what's translated here as in the ruin or devastation, which shall come from far. The Hebrew word is a Hebrew word that I suspect everyone is going to recognize. The Hebrew word is sho'ah. And Shoah, on the one hand, has the meaning of ruin, of destruction. But on the other hand, additionally, there's a specific connotation, because there are, after all, a number of words in Hebrew that can be used for destruction. Something that comes suddenly, something that comes precipitously, something that is close at hand, even though you don't have any means for anticipating it. In Isaiah, Chapter 47, in verse 11, Yet shall evil come upon you, you shall not know how to charm it away. And calamity shall fall upon you, you shall not be able to put it away. And, again, shoah, ruin, destruction, shall come upon you suddenly, before you know it. It's the same word, shoah, that is used in describing the sweeping into the land of Israel of the hordes of Gog and Magog against the people who are described as having been gathered out of many peoples, dwelling safely, all of them. And all of a sudden, you shall ascend, referring to Gog and Magog, you shall come like a storm as expressed in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 9. The storm, all of a sudden, the sky may have been clear, and the dark clouds roll in, and the tempest begins. And indeed, that is the connotation of the Shoah, of which the prophets speak in Sephania, in chapter 1, we read in close juxtaposition, as in Isaiah, about the day of God and the Shoah. In verses 14 and on, the great day of God is near. It is near and hastens greatly. Even the sound of the day of God, wherein the mighty man cries bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of ruin, destruction, and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of reckoning. The theme of suddenness is one that recurs likewise in Proverbs 
in chapter 3, verse 25, be not afraid of sudden terror, neither of the shoah, destruction, ruin, of the wicked when it comes. It comes to the wicked when they least expect it. And this is inevitably then the warning of Isaiah, the question that he poses, not to the people of northern Israel with whom he is not directly in contact, of whom he speaks, but to whom he's not speaking here. This question he poses to everyone who should be learning a lesson from what happened to the doomed inhabitants of northern Israel. So we know what happened to them. What will you do in the day of visitation? What will you do in the ruin that comes from far? Jarring words, terrifying words. We think we can lull ourselves into a sense of security, of tranquility, serenity, and the storm rolls in suddenly when we least expect it. What will you do? Are you ready for it? Of course, inevitably, the final message in verse 4, they can do nothing except crouch as captives, fall as the slain. There's nothing left. And still go. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. The calamity, the devastation, and most of all, the failure to recognize in it a message from God, a summons to write everything that we're doing wrong. This is a theme, admittedly, that we also see in the Torah, in Leviticus chapter 26, in the threatened punishment, if you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments, if you don't live by God's word, if you reject my statutes, if your soul pours my ordinances so that you will not do all my commandments but break my covenant. What's the consequence of this? Of course, punishment. But the punishment grows immeasurably worse when we fail to learn from it. In Leviticus chapter 26, verse 18, And if you will not yet for these things hearken unto me, then I will chastise you seven times more for your sins. And everything gets worse. I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heaven as iron, your earth as brass. And after this new set of punishments, verse 21. The Hebrew reads, if you walk with me or go with me in Keri. Keri being a word that is susceptible to a number of translations. Perhaps the best here is, if you treat me as happenstance, that is, okay, bad things happened, well, that's life. We could just get started and fix things up again. You know, recall, they broke the bricks, so we'll bring hewn stones. They broke the sycamores, we'll bring cedars. If you treat me as happenstance, and will not hearken to me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you, according to your sins. And the next level of retribution begins. And then once again, in verse 23, and if in spite of these things, you will not be corrected unto me, 
but will treat me as happenstance, it just happened coincidentally, then will I also treat you as happenstance, and I will smite you even I seven times for your sins. And again, verse 27, after further punishments and retribution, if you will not hearken for all this unto me, but treat me as happenstance, then I will treat you with the fury of happenstance. And I also will chastise you seven times for your sins. Each time, the severity increases sevenfold until finally, in verse 40, they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers in their treachery which they committed against me. And also that they treated me as happenstance. They need to confess their iniquity in having refused to confess their iniquity any sooner. Indeed, by consequence, I also will treat them as happenstance and bring them into the land of their enemies if then perchance their uncircumcised heart be humbled and they then be paid the punishment of their iniquity. Then will I remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember and I will remember the land. The hope is never lost. Even in that great and terrible day of God, it is after all a day of God. The storm roars in, but it's in order to teach us. And then it abates. God always is extending his hand. And it is in that that we consider these final words of the four times repeated refrain. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And of course, the plain meaning here is that because they refused to listen, they refused to pay attention, they refused to regard all of these levels of retribution as anything other than happenstance, because of this, God's anger is not turned away. Because of this, his hand is stretched out still. Now the hand is, after all, stretched out in punishment. But ultimately, it's also stretched out for us to take it. And most critically, to realize that the question in verse 3 that's addressed in second person is addressed not only to Isaiah's contemporaries in Judah, it's addressed to us. What will you do? in the day of visitation, and in the ruin that comes from far, to whom will you flee for help? There's only one answer to that question that can ever work. And it is by our learning the lessons of the dire fate and utter destruction of the kingdom of northern Israel that we can learn how to rise to this challenge and answer the prophet's question correctly. It's by recognizing that that the curse becomes a blessing. Of course, the ultimate blessing, of course, is returning to God. 
taking the hand that is outstretched and returning to him who has sent us. God bless you.